Hello, everyone. Welcome in to CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined today with John Downs, Director of Business Development uh, of ArcView, member since January of 2015 as a managing director of the Marijuana International Company, where he has helped to develop the company business plan and investment materials. In May of 2016, he co-founded a Bay Area contract manufacturer of cannabis-infused products, helping to develop and launch several infused product brands to the market. He was voted a top three mentor of the first cohort of Gateway, sits on the California Cannabis Industry Association, and he's got an extensive resume here. It keeps going, but what I can tell you is he's an expert when it comes to what we are seeing right now in cannabis, the trend, and I, I couldn't think of a better person to have on. John Downs, thanks for coming on Crush the Street with me. Yes, yeah, my pleasure, Kenneth. Happy to be here, and hello, everybody. John, I've been reading about, and by way of you know kicking this off, <laughs> I've been reading a lot about the California fires, and not many people are familiar with the Emerald Triangle a region of what three converging counties yeah. where a large amount of cannabis farms are and i had read some statistics about 10 to 15,000 farms have been burned down in these historic fires and i want to start off by asking you is this going to be a significant issue in the face of legal recreational cannabis in california come january well I think that there's no doubt that that much supply going offline um, will uh, be uh, will affect prices in the sense that we might not see a precipitous price drop that we could have seen with the amount of uh, cannabis that's produced here in California. Um, the you know the kind of the sense that we we have at Arcview and what we've seen in other states is that when cannabis is legalized and um, we see cultivators come online there's a, a drop in the price. I mean, cannabis is a commodity just like any other uh, agricultural product. And historically, we see the price elevated because of prohibition. Uh, the scarcity that prohibition creates, uh, it keeps prices higher than they would otherwise be in a legal regulated market. So our anticipation is that prices uh, will be dropping uh, in 16 and beyond. Um, maybe not in, excuse me, in 2018, uh, the reason we wouldn't necessarily project a price drop in 2018 is because we think there will be uh, issues with uh, farms being licensed and regulated. And so we don't see all the farms in California suddenly producing cannabis and keeping it here in California. Uh, most folks you know, are probably aware that most of the cannabis that is consumed across the entire United States is grown in that Emerald Triangle area that you described in Northern California. Um, by some estimates, uh, you know, 80% of all the cannabis that's grown in California uh, is exported outside of the state. Now, our belief is that with many of the farms in Mendocino County, um, you know, having unfortunately been affected by the wildfires, you know, some of those um, cultivators in other areas of the Emerald Triangle that were not uh, affected by fires, particularly like in Humboldt County, where they would be able to go and say, hey, well, maybe there is a better likelihood that I'll be able to, to get a license, um, sell into the regulated market here in California, and um, fetch a price that's going to allow me to still uh, keep my farm open. And, you know, many of the folks in Humboldt and other areas of the Emerald Triangle, you know, kind of just dismiss the reg the coming regulated market uh, because they don't believe that there's a real space for them as small craft cultivators, you know, small single family farms, if you will. You know, they think that as as regulations come, undoubtedly the beneficiaries are going to be larger, more industrial scale uh, cultivators like what we see happening in the, Sil uh, the Salinas Valley and, uh, you know, south of San Francisco there all along Monterey and such. Um, there's some huge farms, you know, huge, huge farms, greenhouses that historically have been cut flower production that are now being converted to cannabis. So, um, you know, as tragic as the um, as tragic as the wildfires are, you know, they actually give hope to some other cannabis cultivators 
and other areas that they, um, you know, they will be able to now sell into the regulated market and maintain uh, and maintain pricing uh, margins that will allow them to stay in business. And so, you know, it's a it's a terrible tragedy. It's something that you know we certainly wish uh, hadn't happened, but you know, um, as with you know any of these events, you know, trying to find a silver lining, it could be that there's you know a positive impact on farmers in other areas, small farmers in other areas of the state. Okay, so I guess taking away this whole historic fire, talking about the legalization of recreational cannabis, I know it was a huge thing for Colorado, big deal for the state of Washington. So, in your opinion, what sort of economic stimulus is cannabis, recreational cannabis, going to bring to the California economy? And in general, California is not a very business-friendly state, and it's probably going to have its burdens on the the cannabis-related companies here. But in terms of, in general, uh, the legalization and, and the business that's going to be done, what do you anticipate this to do for the, the local economies here in California? Yeah, yeah, I know. So, I mean, there, there's already a, you know, extraordinarily huge uh, illicit market in California for cannabis. And I think that, you know, we're going to see a significant uh, amount of tax dollars raised as we see the uh, legal markets, uh, regulated markets in 2018 and beyond rolled out. Our projections are that, you know, the, the first year of legalization, uh, we'll see somewhere around, you know, three, three and a half billion in total, uh, total spending but that on cannabis but that doesn't include all the ancillary benefits you know the the lights uh, the uh, real estate the impact of positive real estate values very difficult to find uh, warehousing in Denver for example and, and already in Los Angeles and areas that you know might be in, in zones that will be able to be regulated there's just a tremendous amount of activity surrounding real estate so there's a ton of follow-on benefits to the industry beyond just the, the headline number uh, that we see, which, you know, by 2021, uh, we anticipate cannabis sales in California being in excess of $6 billion. So, you know, that there's an extraordinary amount of economic benefit to having those uh, transactions taxed, regulated. And then, you know, again, as you look beyond just simply uh, the headline sales numbers to the ancillary benefits for multiple industries, you know, ranging from hardware to software, I mean, you know, just across the board, uh, it's going to be a tremendous impact. Uh, I think that, you know, from 2018 through 2021, we're looking at around uh, a, a compound annual growth rate of some 25 to 30 percent. Uh, so that's that's extraordinary uh, growth. And, um, you know, that's going to benefit all Californians, uh, not only in, you know, again, a decrease uh, in, in arrests for uh, possession, uh, and, uh, you know, the social justice benefits and impacts of legalization, but also there's the pure, broad economic impact uh, to the state. John, so let's talk about the simple fact that California is a, is a huge behemoth here. I mean, we got, what, almost 40 million residents, 250 million visitors a year. Um, what is this going to do to the cannabis industry in Nevada and Colorado and Washington, is it going to draw from the, those industries or those states revenues that they're seeing from cannabis? Well, yeah, I think Nevada is a little bit unique in the sense that um, it's such a destination, you know, Vegas being a destination city and you have tourists coming in globally and, you know, they have an industry that's going to be, you know, heavily oriented towards um, tourism, um, which I think will be largely unaffected by California legalizing, but undoubtedly, uh, as we see more markets come online and legalize, you're gonna see uh, Colorado numbers, for example, will, you know, I think, um, start to face headwinds. Uh, there's a, just in my um, my perspective, you know, anecdotally, uh, you know, I've got family, for example, that's in Missouri, uh, you know, and they've, they've driven to California to pick up edibles, and then, you know, or I said California, excuse me, they've driven to Colorado, you know, picked up some stuff, you know, and, and driven back and, you know, and it's like, well, there's, there's, you know, sales numbers for Colorado that, you know, as you see more states uh, across the country start to legalize, you're not going to see that type of, of, um, I guess, you know, cannabis tourism. Now, on the other hand, you know, California, again, much like Vegas, a destination state uh, and a place where folks are going to go, I think we're going to see uh, huge tailwinds to the California cannabis industry 
uh, based on tourism. So I hope that our regulators get it right and uh, end up, you know, passing regulations that allow for consumption in uh, on-site consumption lounges and uh, allow for um, fairs and um, and carnivals and different types of farmers markets and, and events that historically have happened, you know, kind of in this gray area, gray market that we've had since 1996, you know, under the um, uh, the Compassionate Care Act, you know, in the collective model, we've seen, you know, these events spring up. And uh, I hope that there's regulations that come forth when they're announced here, you know, hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, we'll see license types that allow for, you know, special event permits and things of that nature so that we can see uh, cannabis tourism, you know, really be, uh, you know, a viable business out here, just as it has been in Colorado, where, you know, you have different types of cannabis tourism, cannabis um, tours and things of that nature. I mean, you can imagine how many folks come out every single year to visit the wine country in Northern California. You know, there's a huge, uh, a huge amount of folks that I think would come out to visit a cannabis farm, just like they would visit a, a vineyard today. Wow. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's been such a taboo thing for so many years that most people aren't out there seeking it or, or looking around for it, but it's changing. The stigma around it is changing. And it is, uh, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's what's happening here uh, right before our very eyes. I know in Colorado, the chief medical officer for the Department of Public Health recently said there's no major negative impacts that they've seen in Colorado from the legalization of, of cannabis. And I just wonder, how long do you suspect it will take for the rest of the U.S. to legalize recreational cannabis? And to me, it's inevitable at this point, especially with California. That's like the, the nail in the coffin. And I think I even read some statistic that said for everyone who's tried cannabis, they're 70% likely to be pro legalization if they tried it one time in their life and that's going to be self-fulfilling as more and more people continue to try cannabis and probably will go hey what's the big deal well you're absolutely right but undoubtedly you know as california goes the nation follows and you know our belief is that yes with uh, legalization now uh you know full adult use in california in addition to i think eight other states uh, it is only a matter of time before we really see um, other parts of the country, more traditionally conservative parts of the country, you know, the, the Midwest and the South, um, move from, you know, just a medical regime to full adult use legalization. You know, and that advance is, uh, you know, again, it's, it's an, at this point, I think, intractable and will continue. And the belief that I have is that there's such an education gap in uh, in cannabis, you know, folks just don't know about it. You know, they've been historically misinformed. Uh, they might not be have been around it. And as we've seen the advance, you know, first in culture and television and and movies, and you start to see, you know, a bit of normalization that hey, you know, this really maybe isn't the devil's lettuce. Maybe this is a plant that has been used for ten thousand plus years of human history uh, that you know historically has had you know tremendous positive benefits. Um, yeah, you know, let's let's explore those. Let's research those. And then so, you know, as I as I go out and I speak with potential investors, you know, on a day to day basis, you know, really what what captures their imagination and attention, you know, is the amount of research that happens in areas like in Israel and now in Europe. Um, you know, there's just an extraordinary uh, belief in the medical benefits of plant medicine and that cannabis can be, you know, really impactful in in affecting, you know, people's lives in a positive way. And if we look at, and Steve D'Angelo, the co-founder of Arcview Group, has written a great, great book, um, The Cannabis Manifesto, where he really speaks to cannabis being, uh, or using cannabis with more of a wellness philosophy. Um, you know, in Eastern medicine, we would look at everyone on a spectrum, say from zero being, you know, dead to 10 being completely healthy. No one's ever a zero. Well, I guess you can be completely, you know, zero, but typically people are on that spectrum somewhere. They're, they're a degree of health and sickness at all points in their lives and cannabis in many instances uh you know can help uh, positively affect their wellness you know if it's just maybe having a, a a small toke at the end of a long day instead of a glass of wine or a a tumbler of scotch you know that can be a positive impact on someone's life um conversely you know in, in western medicine we typically think hey you're either healthy or you're sick and if you're sick we're going to give you medicine 
And so what we believe, and, and I believe strongly, is that cannabis uh, can positively impact folks' lives, uh, you know, and make them increasingly, you know, well. And, and, uh, and, and in that sense, uh, you know, it will drive greater adoption, lower health care costs. And we've already seen, in fact, that in states that have legalized cannabis, uh, opioid overdose deaths uh, have, have dropped by 25%. So clearly, and also alcohol consumption goes down. So clearly folks are substituting cannabis for some of these, um, you know, opioids and other highly addictive substances that uh, really, you know, are a tremendous health crisis right now. Right. Well, I guess it's anecdotal evidence, but I have a family member who's in the, the, me the medical industry. He's a pharmacist and he's like over the past 35 years, we don't deal with people overdosing on cannabis, but every day there's somebody in the ER who's there for alcohol, who has overdosed on alcohol, but you just don't see it with, with cannabis. And it just really goes to, it, it really makes you scratch your head as to why it's been illegal you know, largely for so many years alongside uh, heroin and cocaine when you have alcohol and cigarettes which which are legal right yeah and and i think that you know there's a pretty clear evidence historically that when we look at you know 1971 i believe when nixon added cannabis to the um you know schedule one uh you know i think john ehrlichman who was one of his advisors has come out and said you know he was pretty clear that he did it so that he would have an excuse to target uh anti-war protesters and hippies that he thought were out to get him and minorities you know people of color and so you know his belief was that by criminalizing cannabis he could um, by extension you know, really be able to crack down on his political enemies and, you know, the, the folks that he perceived to be enemies of American society as he as he viewed it. So uh, it worked, you know, it really worked. And and so, you know, the disinformation campaign and, and by the way, you know, the American Medical Association, you know, not only in 1971 when when cannabis was added to the uh, the the schedule schedule one, you know, they came out in opposition just like they did in 1937 with the Marijuana uh, t uh, Stamp Act, you know, which began taxing cannabis at, at that time, uh, you know, effectively making it illegal. You know, the American Medical Association came out at that time and said, you know, this is kind of silly. You know, we really should not uh, be making this illegal. So medical experts from the very beginning uh, have testified that cannabis is a safe uh, and in many instances for many, um, many illnesses, you know, can be an effective medicine. And unfortunately, you know, for purely political reasons, uh, you know, those those experts have been ignored and, you know, propaganda has been spread uh, to, you know, to, to the negative effects of cannabis, which, in fact, are you know highly overblown. Take, for example, the, the gateway drug theory. I mean, that's been completely disproven uh, by uh, by science. And if you really want to, you know, um, look at the issue, honestly, you know, alcohol is a is a is a gateway drug. You know, and so if when we when we start to really analyze the research and look into the data that historically, um, you know, cannabis is, is safe, effective, it's non toxic, uh, you know, compared to other substances that folks ingest. I mean, you can consume, you know, a whole heck of a lot more cannabis than you can, um, you know, just about anything, including, you know, stuff as simple as like, you, you know, milk or sugar. You know, if you were to overload your body, you know, in the same ratio that you might be able to consume cannabis, I mean, you know, cannabis is not going to affect you negatively and cause you to overdose or have any toxicity. It is non-toxic. You know, you, you, you go to sleep and you might sleep for, for a really long time. So, you know, again, I think there's an education gap. And as we educate folks that, you know, this is a you know, completely non-toxic plant that grows naturally and has um, grown and been used by humans throughout the course of, of our evolution, you know, we start to see, well, hey, you know, maybe this might, maybe it's not for me, but I'm not going to stop other folks from using it because the net negative effects on society are significantly less than other things that we would see, you know, such as alcohol or tobacco that we, you know, choose to um, regulate and tax as opposed to, I mean, could you imagine mm. if we were to just lock up all the cigarette smokers and, you know, try to demonize them and, and throw them in jail? I mean, would that be an effective therapy? You know, if we made folks, 
uh, you know, if we were approached alcohol or tobacco the same way that we approach cannabis. I mean, we already tried it, you know, in the 30s with, uh, excuse me, the 20s with, with alcohol. So um, it just doesn't work. It is amazing. Is. Yeah, you know what? It, it is incredible. And it's going to be a logistic nightmare when California legalizes recreational cannabis and then to try to attempt to control that, to con keep it in the borders. And I guess it's okay if they want to go into Nevada, but you got Oregon and you know Arizona and, and everywhere else that people are wanna, gonna wanna go. It's gonna be a nightmare. And even for police officers, it's, it's like they're gonna have to regulate the people uh, when in their own state, it's not even a crime anymore. You know what I mean? It, they're going to have to regulate it for the sake of other states, which is it seems like it's going to be a big mess. Um, so, yeah, no, I, okay, so let's conclude this interview, uh, John. I, I, looking at cannabis here, the marijuana sector, I mean, along with blockchain and, you know, some other really hot sectors right now, you know, cannabis is just one of the top sectors in terms of growth in the world right now. It's in, it's insane. So by way of conclusion here, let's talk about, you know, what you are anticipating in terms of growth and opportunities in the cannabis space. Well, I think anybody approaching cannabis as an investor, you know, should ask themselves a few questions that are, that are just really important to understanding, you know, how to best approach the industry. And one is, you know, are you comfortable as we say, touching the plant. Are you interested in investing in um, uh, operations that are cultivating or dispensing cannabis? Uh, and if you are, you know, you're, you're doing so in viola you know, violation of federal law. And there's a greater risk that you bear as opposed to investing in ancillary companies, the real estate, um, software as a service that might service the industry, uh, you know, uh, lighting, et cetera, hardware. So, so first I want, you know, any investor that's listening to the podcast, you know, when they think about approaching the industry is try to ask yourself, you know, do you feel comfortable touching the plant or not? If you do, you know, you have to start to factor in a certain set of risks, such as uh, the trend for margins to compress. Prices are going to drop as more supply comes on in a legal regulated market. And then also, uh, you know, you could then say, OK, well, if the price of flour drops, you know, how are people consuming? What we've seen in ArcView market research is that um, in legal regulated states, the percentage of folks that consume flour, you know, smoke the dried flour of ca the cannabis plant, that will decline um, quarter over quarter. And what will increase will be non-smokable uh, consumption, such as uh, vaporizing or edibles. And so you might say, okay, well, let's, you know, I want to be touching the plant. Maybe I'll invest in uh, you know, an extractor that's able to convert that dried flour into an oil that can then be used as a wholesale ingredient in edibles or it can be vaped in a vaporizer. Um, conversely, if you look at the, if you're an investor and you say, hey, you know, I really want to be in the cannabis industry, but I just don't feel comfortable uh, coming in and investing in, in, in uh, plant touching enterprises in direct violation of the Controlled Substances Act, then you might look at uh, investing in you know, agricultural technology, which because the margins are so high in cannabis right now, uh, there's a tremendous amount of research going into optimizing uh, how cannabis is cultivated. Again, there's a real trend from folks uh, or growers, you know, kind of growing in their basements historically where they had to be, you know, keep their their uh, their cultivation side a secret to now, you know, we've got huge 100,000 square foot greenhouses that are popping up. So, you know, the agricultural technology or the advancements in agricultural technology are significant right now. And I think we'll continue to see that until prices compress because those high margins drive the advancement. Same thing with biotech. Um, you know, there's a sig already, you know, we've seen patents um, filed. I mean, the U United States government has a patent on uh, on strain of cannabis as a neuroprotectant, which is ironic considering that they also have it uh, simultaneously on this Controlled Substances Act as a Schedule One substance with no medical benefits. So there's a clear contradiction there. Um, you also look at other areas in the, of the that you can invest in. You know, great companies like um, you know our partner on the research, BDS Analytics. Uh, you know, tracking the market very closely. Um, they're uh, they're 
an analytical statistics company, a research company. They're not touching the plant, but they very much, you know, we see uh, the cannabis industry growth being tailwinds uh, to their growth. So, you know, data, SaaS plays, and then also importantly, intellectual property. I think that any investor looking to approach the sector should understand that there are ways to structure your investment where you can benefit from the growth in cannabis uh, while not actually technically having to be invested in a plant touching enterprise. One way to do that would be to invest in the intellectual property of brands and, and branding companies that then you know license that intellectual property to a plant touching cultivator or extractor and you know give them the ability th so that the cultivator can go out and sell into the supply chain. They're clearly touching the plant, but as the intellectual property holding company, you know, sitting there just licensing uh, the the brand, for example, to to those cultivators, you know, you're able to um, you know claim and, and clearly your investment is in non-plant touching. It's in an intellectual property company as opposed to uh, cultivation. So you know, ask yourself that question as an investor: Do I want to touch the plant? Do I not want to touch the plant? And then that'll drive the decision on where you look. Um, the whole industry is a startup, so you know, investments tend to skew early stage. Um, you know, we're starting to see more Series A's uh, and B's, you know, come to through our network. You know, we've historically funded um, since 2011 when the Arcview Group was founded. Uh, we've um, we funded over 165 cannabis companies. Our, our angel investor members have of which we have about 165 or excuse me, 650 members. Uh, and we placed about 165 million into the industry since 2011. So the companies that are coming through our network are very much um, starting to, you know, we see them growing, maturing, having, um, you know, more revenue uh, per quarter than what historically we would we would have seen in the past. So the industry is growing. Um, I think that any investor that is um, mindful of the potential for cannabis uh, as a, you know, again, modern plant medicine as, um, uh, you know, a, a positive impact on society, both from, you know, stopping, we're going to stop throwing folks in cages um, for using cannabis, but then also we're going to, uh, you know, see a decline in, opi in opioid, opioid overdoses and, uh, you know, help address that epidemic. And, um, you know, so for those reasons or for purely economic reasons, you know, cannabis is a very attractive industry right now. Yeah. No, that's really exciting. John, if people want to learn more about your group, what you guys have to offer, where would they go and what would they find? Yeah, go to arcviewgroup.com. And uh, that's our website. There's a plethora of information and resources to help anyone coming into the industry. You can download an executive summary of our uh, annual state of the marijuana its research report, which is the gold standard for um, cannabis research. Um, there's just a, a lot of opportunity. I think our website is a great place to start, arcviewgroup.com. Um, and feel free to reach out to me directly, uh, John Downs at arcviewgroup.com. Okay, John. Well, hey, thanks for coming on Crush the Street. I really appreciate your time. Uh, and we hope to do this again very soon. Thanks a lot for your time, Kenneth. Um, thanks, everybody, for listening. And uh, yeah, have a great day.